So yeah, Kingdom Hearts 3, after over 16 years, will release on January 25th, 2019 on the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. It only took a decade and a half and it had to spread its massive story across like a dozen consoles, but it's finally coming. So I decided to pick up the 1.5 plus 2.5 remix for the PS4 in order to begin the journey of revisiting the series through one more time before 3 finally launches. It'll be a bit of a long journey, but what is the best way to start if not the beginning? Growing up, I was a complete PlayStation kid. The Nintendo 64 was my first console, but it was the PlayStation 2 where I truly became a gamer. I was just at that right age to enjoy and love some of the console's biggest series like Jack and Daxter, Ratchet and Clank, Resident Evil, and among others, Kingdom Hearts. Oh, Kingdom Hearts. I probably wouldn't be the same dumb edgelord today if it weren't for this series. It was one of the first times I played a game that I felt I could really become completely immersed into its world. There was a lot going on, and nobody could go more than five minutes without saying the word darkness, but I think what really sold me at the time was that it tried to tell an emotional story. I think this game taught me that I'm a huge baby that gets emotional over dumb stuff like this. I spent hundreds of hours into this game as a kid, and while that partially could have been because I just sucked at it and needed to grind for hours on end just to beat it, I stuck with it regardless and never found myself bored. It had fun but sometimes challenging combat, Disney characters that I knew and recognized, humorous and dramatic moments that made for a memorable story, absolutely incredible top-notch music by the illustrious Yoko Shimomura, as well as, and I'm claiming it now, don't at me, the catchiest opening for any game ever. And yet, it's quite a miracle we even got Kingdom Hearts, at least in the way that it was actually released. I guarantee, up until this point, a young you or me watching some Disney movie never would have said, you know what would have made this movie better? Anime Boys! But alas, here we are now. I don't know what the hell that boardroom meeting at Square Enix looked like, but it sure must have been magical. But as this is a retrospective of sorts, what I really want to talk about today is how well the game aged, and as it is a game, let's start with the gameplay. Unlike its older sibling, Final Fantasy, Kingdom Hearts is based on real-time combat, rather than turn-based. You pretty much just need to mash the X button until the credits roll, as it's the attack button. Just chain together combos and equip new abilities to yourself as you level up to really bring the pain to your enemies, and you'll be good to go. Despite the change of combat style typical of most JRPGs, Kingdom Hearts is still a JRPG, which makes it a numbers game. You defeat enemies to gain experience, and you gain experience to level up, which in turn makes you more powerful by granting you more hit points, new spells, increased damage, defense, and increased magic bar, as well as ability points, or AP, to customize a specific play style of skills best suited for you. On top of this, you will also get equippable items that impact your stats in various ways, which include accessories and more powerful keychains for your keyblade. Different magic abilities and items can also be hotkeyed for easier access in the heat of combat. Each level generally sticks you in the world of a Disney movie where you meet the characters, maybe get a new party member, and somewhat loosely go through a super condensed version of the film in which you go back and forth between objectives spread out through a pretty open and somewhat non-linear map until you defeat the big baddie and seal the keyhole, rinse and repeat, with the occasional major story development not exclusive to the Disney world but more on the Final Fantasy type side of things, revolving around main protagonist Sora. But remember when I said earlier that as a kid I had hundreds of hours into game and that was maybe because I sucked at it? Well by golly was this last playthrough a bit of a slap in the face to that. When I record game footage, I try to separate my recordings by level, chapter, or hour, and while recording for this, I realized, huh, these levels are a lot shorter than I remember them being. And that was because each recording session ended up being almost always 40 minutes long, give or take a bit. I recall thinking when I was little that there often seemed to be no real direction to what I was supposed to be doing, and often would get lost and just run around until I'd accidentally stumble into the right spot or talk to the right person. But I also don't even think I was sentient it until like 17, so who even knows if I knew how to read back then, because it only took me 14 hours to beat the game this time around. How Long to Beat states that it could be roughly 27 hours for the main story, which is pretty much all I did. I was really underleveled when I beat it this time, but still, take that 10 year old me. It was one of those realizations about the argument that when you play a game as an adult, it will be much easier than you recall it being from when you played it as a child. For example, when I was little, I recall the second Riku fight being really challenging for me. I got stuck on it for a long time. It's a very fast-paced fight that requires you to put in all the skills you should have learned thus far, and really pushes them. 
The general school of thought for gaming difficulty goes, overcoming a difficult challenge is rewarding, especially if the challenge is fair in nature, and your own failure to complete it is a lack of the required skill at the time, not due to any unfairness of the game itself by poor design. So when we get past a part that we've been stuck on for ages, it feels really good and exciting knowing you finally did it. It's the cathartic release we've been waiting for. But when I got to Riku in this recent playthrough, I beat him on my first try. In that moment, I had two conflicting emotions. First, I was really excited. He kicked my butt when I was little, but look who is better at mashing X now. It made me realize how much better I had become at the game, and how something so challenging was now done in what felt like nothing. But secondly, I couldn't help but feel a little disappointed. I didn't feel like I had a challenge to overcome anymore, which ultimately made this grand battle just feel like a slightly more complicated version of any other boss I'd faced thus far. It's really hard to say whether or not this can be seen as a positive or a negative overall, so I suppose just take that with a grain of salt and be the judge for yourself. Obviously my situation with this game in particular won't apply to everyone, but I'm sure some of you have had similar experiences with other games before. Okay, so I was joking earlier a bit about the whole X button mashing thing, but I feel like that actually warrants more discussion, so let's take a bit of a closer look into the controls for a bit. Any action game will have an attack button, some games more than one, but multiple attack buttons aren't necessarily required for any action game to be good. Let's compare to a hack and slash like Devil May Cry. In those games, which rely on stylish variations and combos by mixing together various playstyles, you need to use a wide variety of buttons in order to pull those moves off. The gameplay of those games actively encourages and incentivizes you to play differently. Kingdom Hearts, on the other hand, while only having that one attack button, has other controls that are necessary in parts that assist in combat. Square allows you to block and dodge roll. Rolling can effectively help you escape a tight situation to give you breathing room from an enemy, and a well-timed block will do exactly what it sounds like, negate the damage from an enemy attack. Circle allows you to jump, and late in the game, glide. This can be used to reach otherwise inaccessible areas, as well as serve as sort of an aerial dodge. L1 allows you to quickly access hotkeyed magic spells and items, making it so you don't need to manually navigate through the D-pad menus in the thick of things. And then there's R1, which allows you to lock onto enemies. Like Kingdom Hearts 2, the first game does have reaction commands that will sometimes appear that you must press triangle to activate, allowing Sora to perform special maneuvers. However, they aren't as plentiful in this game as they are in the sequel, and are not meant to be a replacement to your main attack button, but rather situational depending on when the on-screen prompt appears. Admittedly, combat, especially in the game's first few hours, is a bit clunky and slow. But as you unlock more abilities, which will feel like a gradual but nearly seamless transition, the combat will spice itself up. As it stands on its own merit, Kingdom Hearts' combat is a good first attempt, if not quite perfect. It always manages to make itself entertaining regardless. Lastly on gameplay, I guess I kinda have to talk about the gummy ship for a moment. It's a thing? Yeah. Moving on. On to presentation. I was never a graphics snob when it came to games I played. As a kid, I didn't even really consider them much. I was much more preoccupied with whether or not the game was fun, but looking back with a more critical eye... I'd say that based off my memory of the PS2 version of Kingdom Hearts, it was pretty good looking. It's been a long time since I've played the original, and with the added content of Final Mix, I can't really see myself ever going back to the original, but the models are great looking. With the subsequent re-releases, you can really tell how well this game aged graphically. The textures have since been cleaned up more, and the game looks crisper than ever. I distinctly remember thinking that had it not been for a few small things, the game could almost pass for a cartoony but modern game. The biggest issue I have graphically with Kingdom Hearts is this weird thing the game sometimes does when characters speak. When characters speak, they have two different ways for which they are animated. First, the characters speak and express themselves through their eyes and mouths, which are modeled. This allows for them to emote in real time and have proper lip sync. It looks good, but is only used in the game's actual cutscenes. Second, the eyes and mouths are replaced with flat textures that open and close when necessary, but it doesn't exactly look good. This is mostly used when no dialogue is voiced in short scenes where a fully animated cutscene isn't necessary. In this context, it's totally fine, I have no problems with it. But where I have a problem is when these two styles go back and forth in a single cutscene. One line of dialogue could have a fully animated lip sync, and the next line could just be a changing texture. It's a little jarring. I understand this was likely a hardware limitation of the PS2, but looking back it's still a minor nitpick. Everything else in the game is visually stunning and I never tire of looking at it. 
I feel the game's cartoony art style when compared to Final Fantasy actually works really well in favor when considering how visually well the game is aged. The first thing I could think of to compare it to was something like Final Fantasy VIII, since the two games are only a few years apart, and since it tried to go for a more realistic look. Now, obviously the PS1 has much lower hardware specs than the PS2, so I'm not trying to say that the game has to look like Kingdom Hearts, but I don't think VIII's style lent itself well to time. The voice acting is pretty good too. Haley Joel Osment was a great pick for Sora. Since most actors in video games tend to be adults, it was nice to have somebody who was actually the same age as the protagonist, especially since you will be hearing him speak so frequently. And on that note, the actors of all the three main characters, Sora, Riku, and Kairi, were all young, so it never feels like Sora is surrounded by people his age but sound 40. A large bunch of the Disney characters also reprise their voice actors from their respective films. This includes Aladdin, Alice and Wendy, Hades, Ursula, Jack Skellington, and tons others. Characters that have different voice actors I feel have varying results. I find that the woman that voices Maleficent did an excellent job, but then there's some glaring others that just make me uncomfortable. For example, Dr. Finkelstein, where all I can hear when he speaks is Wacko Warner, and the most egregious of the two is the genie, where all I can hear is Homer Simpson. He doesn't sound like Robin Williams at all to me. This game also had some very high-profile screen actors brought in to voice a lot of the Final Fantasy characters, which I felt worked pretty well. This included David Boreanaz and Mandy Moore, as well as Billy Zane for the main protagonist, Ansem. They did good. And now, on to the big one itself, the story! Hooray! The story is actually quite good. Since it's the first in the series, it's fairly self-contained and easy to follow, if perhaps a little ridiculous in hindsight. You can't tell me that a game that ends with Mickey Mouse appearing out of the darkness to help aid a bunch of anime-looking kids from what basically looks like the end of the world wouldn't be met with extreme confusion and possible concern if told to a non-gamer. Despite that, I have a lot of nostalgia for this game, and its story, regardless of how silly it gets. It knows exactly how to pull all sorts of emotional punches, and by golly, it knows I will eat that shit up. But if for some reason you've gotten this far in the video and aren't familiar with the story, in which sorry for any spoilers you've gotten thus far, it's actually pretty straightforward. Sora is a young boy living on an island with his friends, where they yearn to leave and explore other worlds. However, the island is attacked by mysterious creatures born of darkness known as the Heartless, which envelop the island, separating Sora from his friends in island, but not before a mysterious weapon known as the Keyblade appears before Sora. He learns he is the Keyblade Master, who can wield its power to destroy the Heartless and save the worlds from darkness. From there, he teams up with Donald and Goofy, who are searching for King Mickey, in order to look for his friends Riku and Kairi, as well as uphold his duties as the Keyblade Master. It isn't until the second game that things really start to get complicated, but I feel the story gets across just splendidly in the time that it takes to complete. It isn't too short, but not too long so as to overstay its welcome. Once you get over the initial shock of having Donald and Goofy attached to your sides 24-7, you'll find there's a lot of substance here that is only amplified by everything else I've discussed so far. The characters are all wonderful, and you'll really hope that in the end everything goes well. I wanted to see Sora find his friends again. I wanted to see how Riku would overcome his darkness. I wanted to see Kairi, well, be in the game. Okay, you don't see her too often, but I really wanted to see more of her when she actually was there. She spends most of the game missing her catatonic, only really getting to shine in the last act, but I liked her despite that. But Sora and Riku actually have pretty evolving character arcs that are great to see from start to finish. But that's pretty much all I got on this one. Kingdom Hearts was a strange concept for a game that miraculously came out despite its premise, and stranger yet, that it was actually really good. Lots of people my age grew up with the franchise, and its high sales and high critical scores helped pave the way for a series that is still going strong today, complete with a very dedicated fan base, myself included. If you liked my analysis on the first game, be sure to subscribe, because next time I'll be taking a look at the game most people say is the best in the series, Kingdom Hearts 2. And with that, thanks for listening to my long and hopefully cohesive rant on a game I enjoy, and I'll see you all in the next video.